discussion in this particular session. What I'd like you to do is talk to one person next to you just to start up a conversation on this. What are some specific examples of when you need to influence? You. Not in general, but when you need to influence. Start a conversation. Increasingly, people don't necessarily just report to us. We have to influence them, and it's cross-function. And they've got their own lingo, they've got their own priorities, different incentives, and things like that. Okay. Yeah, what we're saying. Another thing is influencing your own managers when sure. they're off-base, right, yeah. and you're closer and more informed than they are. Right, yeah. Did, 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 did that ever happen? Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I know a guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> But isn't it true that you have to influence your boss, right? You have to influence your boss because uh, he or she is going to make a decision, and to you, this is like a train wreck that's going to happen in slow motion right in front of you, and you're like, how do I get, how do I stop this from happening? And yet you don't have the authority in that situation. Right? Yeah, let's get a couple more. Uh, what else? Yeah. 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 Ye
Influence means change, okay? Think of it that way. Influence means change. So, whether it's a, a boss, whether it's a stakeholder, whether it's a spouse or a child, regardless what it is, if nothing changed, you didn't influence. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get a change of some sort. So uh, what I'm interested in, though, is where do we cross the line to manipulation, do you think? Because there's some interesting, uh, Brian alluded to it. I mean, we're being influenced all the time. And some of that is, I think we could more say, is borderline manipulation as well. So where's that? What do you think? So I think manipulation would be where I'm getting some type of advantage, um, and the other person is not. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm getting some advantage. Right. So it comes from uh, an ego system. Maybe. No so yeah, so it's maybe more of an ego-driven thing. I'm getting an advantage. <laughs> and and I, direct, I, think, I think there is something about an unfair advantage. And, and yet, when you're trying to influence your boss, you are trying to get an advantage that you don't have, or at least level the playing field. But if you're, I, I think it's kind of a thin line. Where are you? Did you have your hand there? Yeah, influence, I mean, it kind of parallel with the win win scenario, a win for all. That's what seems more win. Where manipulation is a win for the user. Right, which is kind of similar there, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so here's an example. I, I, think, I think, I mean, there's some clear lines of ethics, but there's other stuff where, man, is it. And I think sometimes we can't tell because we don't know the intent of the person who's doing it. But over in the UK, one of the things they wanted to do is increase organ donation. So instead of opting in, you had to opt out. Okay? Guess what happened to organ donation? Skyrocketed. Is that influence or manipulation? I think it's an interesting question because I think I'd want to interview the people afterwards. You go, do you know what you just did? <laughs> and, and they did. A lot of people afterwards goes, yeah, yeah, I kind of, I, I just right thing to do. But they wouldn't have done it before. And so, the people who did it said, this is a wonderful, you know, we influenced an out outcome for the greater good. My point of this one is, I think it's difficult to know sometimes. And so in this short discussion that we have here, I want to talk about things that, uh, that between people that we've interviewed on the People and Projects podcast and other resources, so this isn't really going to be Andy's take on this, this is going to be a lot of people that have studied this and said, do these things, you're going to be more influential. But here's the danger. Everything we talk about can be used for good or evil <laughs> in some ways, right? And they're using it against us. So part of it will be, in the time that we have, how to use this stuff in your role, but also how to defend against it. You up for that? Okay. Because we want to be able to do that. So what I'd like you to think about is what uh, Tim David says. Now, Tim wrote a book called True Influence. And I just looked it up on, I, actually, so one of my uh, UN clients was, was going, hey, I looked it up on Amazon. It's like $300 for the book. I'm like, that's a good book, but it's not $300. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I got a whole tip. He just got back to me today, and he goes, someone has a company by the same name as the title, and they sued him for it. So he's re so he re re retitling the book, four levels of, because it's an acronym, T-R-U-E, so there's four levels to it. So he's retitling it. It's supposed to be out in the next couple of months. So don't go looking for it now. Don't pay that. <laughs> but you might want to listen to the interview. But one of the things that that uh, I asked him was, you're an influence guy, you're married. Do you think your wife is constantly like, I wonder if he's playing? Yeah. 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 And, and then I said, do you think so? And this is what he said. Influence is what people do to help. If you're not helping, you're not doing it right. So if you use some sort of technique to trick your boss into something, that's going to be manipulation. If we're not making it better, if you need to sign off from somebody and they've been dragging their feet, and you withhold some information, and it's just going to make it worse for them, that's not it. That's going to be manipulation. And influence is what we do to help. Now, the Pitlock Guide is not silent. In fact, the sixth edition is really kind of in your face about this. Specifically, it, it calls out there's negotiation, there's autonomy, there's power. In fact, check out this quote from the sixth edition. Top project managers are proactive and intentional when it comes to power. These project managers will work to acquire power and authority they need within the boundaries of policies, protocols, and procedures rather than wait for it to be granted. Isn't that interesting? So the pinback guy, which sometimes I feel like in the past is not addressed it like this, it's like, listen, you are out there to actively acquire it instead of wait for it. And I think a lot of us have kind of this uncomfortable kind of you know, relationship with power. Like we don't want to be the people that are elbowing, we don't want to be the butt kissers, we don't want to be the schmoozers or whatever. And, and there's lots of different views we have of influence. But I think it's interesting that that's what the pinback guy talks about here. I had the opportunity to interview Dan Rust. He wrote a book called Workplace Poker. 
Workplace Poker, it's, it's one of the best books on organizational politics that I've written in a while. And uh, he says, people, people say this all the time, everybody who says, our place is so political. Oh, we got so much politics there. I was working with a, a guy, actually, his office isn't too far from here. He came from more than 12 people in this company. He's the CEO. We're talking about some ideas, and he goes, I like it, I like it. And I'm like, so Don, is this something you're going to take action on? Like a good coach, I think, should ask for accountability. He goes, I gotta run it up the flagpole. I'm like, you are the flagpole. You know? <laughs> You're the CEO. But even in a 12 person company, there's politics. But look how Dan says it here. He goes, like, dancing a beautiful ballet in a minefield. If you ignore the landlines or do nothing but complain about them, you're likely to lose a few toes. Okay? So here's the deal if N is greater than 1, you've got politics. You've got situations where you've got to find a way to try to influence without manipulating. All right? To, to do it ethically, to do it in a way that has mutual benefit. Not just to your own benefit, but it's not necessarily easy to do. So I want you just to take a minute and think of who's somebody you want to change. Now, it doesn't quite sound like that. Right? But really, if, if influence is change, who is somebody that you want to influence? Okay? And you're not going to have to share this with anybody if you don't want to, but it could be a, uh, it could be a boss, it could be a stakeholder. But, but what I want you to do is to think through specifically the who, specifically the what. Now, don't say, I want my colleague Bob to stop being an idiot, because that's hard to fix. Right? <laughs> but, but that's not what we're saying. But, but like, I want, my, I want this person on my team that when they're in the, when they're in the daily stand-up, they don't go into problem solving, because that's not what you do during the stand-up. So that would be a very specific thing that we're trying to steer away. So if you can think of a very specific thing and a person. I'd like to maybe use that as we go through. Okay, so you won't have to. You don't have to tell me what it is. But I will solicit a couple examples. Take a minute, write down who's a person that you want to influence. What's the specific change that you would want to get? More specific, the better. What makes it different? Right? Go ahead, write that. Down. Last one was. Uh, I'm okay, my husband. <laughs> And uh, so what's the change? He goes, I want him to tell me where he's at at night. I'm like, no. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm not going to go out and give you an example here, right? But, uh, but can you think of it? Can, can you give me an example of, of someone you're trying to influence? Yes. So my example, uh, I, I'm a senior member of the three chairs of a, a committee of volunteer work. And one of the three chairs Really, although I think she understands the tasks and the degree that she's going to cover, yeah. she's kind of inattentive to them and, and sort of forgets to follow up and, and do the work. Right. And, and so, yeah, is, there a, is there a specific thing by the end of the year you want her to get done or something by the next meeting in January? Or? It's just a recurring ongoing thing. So, okay. we, we manage activities on a series of events, multiple events every month. Right. And so, we need to basically be on top of managing the volunteers that we are. Right. Right. So as we go through this, think of one specific change. Like I want her to get, to her to get, yeah. Yeah. I want her to get by this time. So think about that. Okay. So um, well, the more specific it is, the easier it is to come up with influence. Right? That's the thing. To change somebody to go from inattentive to on top of it is kind of sometimes difficult. But there's times it's like right, you're not going to change, but I need this done by that day. You know, that sort of thing. Okay? What's another example? Yes. So I have recently had a new team mm -hmm. uh, come into my portfolio, yeah. and the manager is on board with project management as a concept, mm -hmm. but the senior engineer is not a fan of concepts of things like time tracking, reporting, status updates, making sure that I know what's going on at all. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem because he, he has influence over the rest of the team, Sure, because yeah. they all look to him uh, and he's the guy. Yeah, right. He's the guy. And as long as he pushes back, then right. it's like, yeah. And by the way, who loves time tracking and status reporting? <laughs> so we don't do it because we love it. We do it because it helps, it provides transparency or information so we can make decisions and things like that, right? Okay, and yeah, last one, yes. I have, like, also received a bit of pressure in here online. Um, I'm going to bring the firm. So is it engineers or the problems? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me that, and then 
it's a constant struggle. Absolutely. I, I, I work with a bunch of auditors at the Fed, and they're like, we're trying to help the banks. Yeah. But whenever they hear the word auditor, what happens, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, so let's go with those. And, and make, once again, to maybe very specifically, there's this one information, piece of information I want before we're gone for the holidays. You know? If you can think of that, you don't have to share it with me, but as, you, as we go through that, you can think of it. Now, this, uh, I sent Cynthia some information, so I don't know where it's at or from a handout. If you can download the slides, I'm not sure, but uh, she's got it anyway. So you can get that later on. But uh, there's a, a model that I find, it's a rare week that I don't go back to when I try to understand a, a conflict situation or an influence situation. Like, why did somebody react that way? Why would they scatter when they hear that I went and I just need this information? Why would this engineer not want us to, you know, to why would they not want to do this? Well, uh, it's it's a model put together by a guy named David Rock at the Neural Leadership Institute, and SCARF is an acronym, and in SCARF, the S stands for stats. Now, what this would say, generally speaking, the brain is more towards leaning in towards reward away from threat, right? And so, when you're trying to influence someone, which I think his most recent book would actually back this up, that what you need to do is make sure you're not threatening someone's stats, okay? Auditor has an easy way, you're gonna kick somebody in their ass right away, right? <laughs> they're gonna be like, auditor, they're out to catch me, that's gonna reduce my status, they're gonna find something, the engineer might be like, hey, you know, for some people, information is power, and so they're like, I don't need to share that information, so I think without even realizing it, we kick people in the ass, so to speak. What we do, it could be body language, it could be, well, let me just say it slower. <laughs> uh, or, well, listen, I, I, I'm a PMP. See, I got the tattoo, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, we, uh, we pull our certification rate and, or something like that. It, that'd be a very easy thing that we can put someone's stats. I'm telling you, if you kick somebody in their S, so to speak, it's going to make it more difficult. You want to raise someone's status? I'm on a mission to raise the status of people around me. Join me on this one. Because you can influence so much more if you do it. Raise the status, and if something good happens, celebrate with them. They deliver something, celebrate with them. Okay? The more you can raise your status, the better. So the C stands for certainty. People want certainty. When you take certainty away, it's more difficult. But when you're trying to get someone to do something, the more you can provide certainty. And think about us as project managers, or project of, of what regards to the role, scrum master, something. We can say, that's the hill we're aiming for, this is how we're gonna get there. The more that we can create certainty, the more they're gonna be willing to say yes because they know what they're getting themselves into. But sometimes people have trouble getting the yes it's because they don't understand. So the more we can provide certainty, the better. Autonomy is just, uh, over and over you see this, that the more people feel like they have autonomy, the more they're, they're gonna be okay, the brain will sell down. When they feel like they don't have choices, that's a problem. So you want to influence somebody, bring choices to the table. Not too many choices, but bring choices to the table. They're more likely to be influenced by having autonomy. The R, the R is relatedness. And think of relatedness as we feel like we're of the same tribe. Okay? So you're more likely to be able to influence somebody. So, uh, so I'm so glad we had an auditor in the room. That is awesome. Because auditors feel like they're outside the tribe. This is somebody, this is the enemy tribe coming in, and they're trying to find a problem. Right? And so, so uh, I had the opportunity to interview the guy who founded Harvard's uh, International Negotiation Program, Program on Negotiation, and he goes, we are more tribal than we want to be. We, we want to believe that that's something that in other cultures it is alive and well here. And it's not just an IT tribe versus a, a, a R&D or a marketing tribe. Even within your group, you have tribes. If the same group of people go to lunch every day, guess what, that's like a mini tribe. And if you feel like you're on the outside of the tribe, so to speak, then it, it makes it more difficult to influence. And so if you want to influence someone, you have to find a way to make it like we're part of the same tribe. And I don't even like the tribal terminology, it's just using the literature, but if you think of it as, do people feel like we are we? <clears throat> this is why the dirty little secret business is everything comes down to relationships. If you have a stronger relationship with that person, you're going to be more able to, to build, to, to influence them through their relationship. Not manipulate them, although that could happen too, but it, it's more, you're more likely to be able to influence them. Right? And then the F is fairness, that, that people want to feel like things are fair. I have a friend who's a CEO, and whenever his kids go, but dad, that's not fair, this is his line. We don't live at the fair. 
Okay? So if you have kids, hopefully that's not the most beneficial thing you get out of today, but it works with the kids, you know? But, but the truth is it's not fair. Sometimes things aren't fair. But the more that when we're making decisions, when we're trying to do things, the more it can feel like it's fair, appear to be fair. So we're listening to them, and we're, we're genuinely listening. We're not just asking their feedback for the feedback to make the decision anymore, right? So the more that you do these things, the more you're going to be able to influence. The, the more of these that you step on, the more difficult it is to be able to influence that. I just blank the screen. Uh, what's the S? Status. Raise their status, right? You want to influence someone? Raise their status. We'll talk about another term for that a little bit. C? Certainty. certainty. Give them certainty. This is where we're going. This is why if you sign up on this, here's the next step. This is why this helps. The A? Autonomy. Autonomy, right? A nurse told me this. She goes, I don't like giving shots to kids, but here's a little trick I've learned. Do you want to, you know, the kid's crying. Do you want to the shot in your left arm or the right arm? This one. <laughs> the kid doesn't cry as much. It's autonomy, right? The R? Relatedness, which means together. We're, we're the we, right? We are the we. Find the we, which means you have to branch out your relationships a lot further. Right? A lot further in your relationships. And the F? Fairness. Fairness. You got it, right? So you do those things, it's going to help you influence. Now, the Pinbach guide, some that are specifically called out, this is a subset, but reward or coercive. Reward means you can give some sort of reward. A lot of times we think of this as tied to our title because I can give you a raise and give you a bonus or things like that. But it doesn't have to reward. Like a uh, reward could be, you know, giving. What would be an example that you can give as a reward? Gift card. Praise. Gift card. Praise. Exactly. Some sort of praise. Credit. Credit. I, I as an auditor can go away. That could be a form of reward. <laughs> yeah, you're done with me. Right? That could be it. Now coercive. Uh, we, we think of it just more of like a penalty, some sort of a, but this would just be like, well, if they don't do this, then there's some sort of uh, uh, negative consequences or something. Positional and referent, positional would just be like positional power because of the title. It's pretty powerful. Referent is more like personal power, if you remember that terminology, positional versus personal. Referent just be, it's like that person's charisma. Can you think of that person who just talks to you with a thing? Do you have that person? Like, this, I've got a friend, he talks to me to go on a golf outing. I believe he liked the golf. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not with him. So, so that, that's his charisma that seems to talk me into that. Um, how about expert in information? If someone is known as the expert, there's a lot of power that comes with that. Informational, this is why a lot of administrative assistants have a lot of power. They were in the meeting. They heard the discussions. They've seen the slides and the spreadsheets. They know who's going to get fired and who's not going to. Informational power is like the schoolyard equivalent of like, <laughs> tell me, no, can't tell you, right? And informational power is definitely strong. And then relational and ingratiating. Relational is just basically who you know. And I actually, I personally have just found this is like the underpinnings of almost everyone. That if you have strong relationships, it's just incredible of how you can influence. Okay? And then ingratiate. You know what that word means? It's not like a word we use very often. You know me. But kind of you know me, yeah. yeah. It, it, it mentions it in the pen pocket. It's, it's basically flattery. Influence versus flattery. Yeah, flattery. So uh, in uh, episode 200, I had the opportunity to interview Jeffrey Pfeffer, the Stanford, uh, pretty provocative, pretty controversial professor in many ways. And he talks his book, Power, about, uh, about flattery. And I, I, can I just preface this with, I genuinely hope this isn't the most important thing you take away from that, OK? But, he talks about how Jennifer Chapman, a Berkeley professor, she studied flattery. This is what she expected to find. Flattery works for a while, like the inverted U. It works for a while, and then it tails off because you're a sucker. Yeah. Right? That's what she expected. That'd be like an inverted U. You know what she found? This is a direct, direct way to say. There might be a point which flattery became ineffective, but she couldn't find it in the data. So here's how it works. But it works, 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 works. So there's two reasons I bring this up. Not for you necessarily to use it, but some of us don't even get close to it. We don't even get close to it. And secondly, people are using it on you. I think about this with my 18-year-old daughter. <laughs> Stay away from that smooth doctor. I'm telling you. So uh, Eric Barker wrote this book called Barking Up the Wrong Tree. It's a fabulous book. I definitely recommend it. But he says, he says in Barking Up the Wrong Tree, the subtitle is something like, why everything you know about success is mostly wrong. And he 
talks about, and I, I, it actually might be Pfeffer's work, I don't recall, I know it's not Barker's, but he says, person A, uh, work results like this, okay? Relationship with the boss, this. Person B, work results here, relationship with the boss, here. You know, you know where I'm going with this, right? So who gets promoted? B, right? Everything about that goes against everything we believe, but it just goes to show that there's something. In fact, he actually says in that same chapter, bosses fall, they succumb to flattery even when they know it's flattery. Okay? Uh, so basically, if you go up to your boss, go, that was a brilliant presentation. Your boss, my inside is like, I don't know if it was brilliant, but it was pretty good. <laughs> okay? So I'm mostly interested in you to be. Uh, able to defend against this because we succumb to it far, far more easily than what we want to believe. And some of us have a better nose for it than others, I'm telling you, we fall, we fall prey to it. And I'm not saying use it nearly as much as it is a weapon and some of us don't even get close to pulling it out, okay? And so some forms of prey is something like that, right? So where would you guess, uh, uh, this, this comes from um, one of Rita Mulcahy's, one of the editions of uh, the prep book, a PFP prep book. Which would you say is the most powerful, uh, uh, the most sustained? Most often, I mean, all of them can be powerful, all of them can work, but what, what would probably be the best on a sustained basis? Uh, in that particular edition, it said reward an expert. Reward an expert. To the degree you give some sort of reward, to the degree you give, uh, develop expertise. Okay? What do you think would probably be least effective most of the time? Uh, yeah, coercive and positional in that particular edition of Reader's book was uh, pulled out from a project management perspective. And I don't know what, what literature she got that from, if it was some in PMI writing or some external to PMI. But can we just talk about that in a second? Because it seems to me that coercive is pretty powerful. If you've got a boss that goes, hey, get this done or you're fired. I don't know about you, I think that seems pretty motivating, right? But why is it? Why is it, yeah, so why not for the long term? It's <laughs> a very honest answer, right? Uh, yeah. After, after, after a while, well, first of all, sometimes it can be do this or you're fired, and then it never happens. It's like the parent that's like, all right, you're going to three. And they're like, one, two, two and a half, two and three quarters. You know, they never get to three, or their kid's never grounded, or there's no, there's nothing behind it. And so if the, if the boss is just, you know, all bark, no bite, so to speak, it's ineffective. But let's say that's not, let's say they are like, get this done or you're fired. The more they pull out the curse, after a while, you're like, make my day. Okay. Right. I just like leading by terrorism. It doesn't Shit. open up respect right. and yeah. new ideas and innovation. Yeah. And things, and you might get the task done, but you're not going to get the results you want. Yeah. Like I, I think we, we're on your what team. the team did, yeah. they sabotaged this person who got fired by literally following those directions exactly. Right. Right, exactly. There you go. So, so I think we'd all agree, all in favor of not using coercive as much as possible, right? You know, right, we're all there. But it's interesting how it does happen. Like I can see that easily in your sort of situation, which you're influential anyway, because when Brian was trying to do the introduction, everyone's still talking, and you were the shusher, and everyone got quiet when you were the shusher. So you're already really, really, uh, you're already influential. But, but it's the uh, listen, you comply. Right, so I mean, that's how some organizations try to do some sort of process. And sometimes you have to go to scarcity, we'll talk about that, but be very careful about when you use that sort of thing. This is uh, Cialdini here, Influence is the book that he's best known for. Um, classic book, his most recent one is called Presuasion. Presuasion says, what can you do in the moment, right before you try to influence, that can make it more likely that the person will say yes, okay? What can you do right there in the moment? An example that he gives in the book is it uh, gives somebody a reputation to live up to. It's like it's a, his version of raise their status. He, had, he talks about in the book a colleague who had made a mistake, and the colleague comes up and he goes, Hey, Bob, man, I'm so sorry I made this mistake. And, but you know, you're such a nice guy, I want you to hear it from me. So, and what Charlie said, he said this right there in the interview, he goes, I, I found myself saying, um, It's okay, man, it's okay. Thanks for letting me know. And the guy walks out, and then I'll say, I wonder if I just got played. Because <laughs> what did that guy say to him? Bob, you're such a nice guy. It's a version of persuasion. Right before that, it's a version of the flattery. It's 
doesn't it really stink that in some ways that it's effective like that? And once again, I'm not, I'm not telling you go out and be a, a flatterer, but I'm just saying people are using that on you, but it's a version of scarf. It is say, if, if, if Bob was a real jerk, that's lying. But if he is a nice guy, that's not lying. And so if you say to this person, like, listen, is it Drew? Yeah. Uh, listen, I know you see you here. I'm telling you, this place, you have made such a difference. People listen to you. People follow your lead. You cast a long shadow around here, right? So you're raising the person's status. You're, you're, you're giving them a reputation to live up to. Like, listen, I know you're not totally into this. The truth is, some of this, I don't like either. Here's why we're doing so. There's some certainty there, but you're trying to build a relationship there. So I'm not saying this is him just gonna, there's no way this guy's gonna let go for it. But still, if you try some of the stuff, that's what I'm saying. Give the person a reputation to live up to. Now, in uh, in this book, he talks about six weapons of influence, right? Six weapons of influence. Reciprocity. You you uh, you open the door for someone, what do they want to do? They feel compelled to open the door for you. You, know, you, you pay for someone's lunch because they you want to have for one reason, they feel compelled to do that back. Reciprocity, he's found in every culture he's studied. We don't want to be in debt to other people. Reciprocity is required. So this could be, how can you help that engineer? You know, how can you, as an auditor, find ways to make their life easier to the degree you can do that? That's reciprocity. Commitment and consistency is an interesting one. And people, if you can get them to make a commitment, they're more likely to follow through on it. So obvious as that sounds, we often don't ask for a commitment. Here's what I mean by this. Here's an example in the book. A, a restaurant that's taking reservations. At the end of the call, uh, this is what happens. Hey, uh, we got you down for a party. So I'm the restaurant. We got you down for a party too, Saturday at 6.30. If you can't make it, just give us a call. See you Saturday night. Now, that's a pretty normal way to end the conversation. Okay? Most people show it's a good restaurant. But of the people that didn't show, 30% of them did not call. And at least in American culture, we hold that table for at least 15 minutes, maybe a half hour, that's money left on the table. So they made just a small change to the script. Hey, we got you down for a party too, say at 6.30. By the way, if you can't make it, will you call us? Pause. Now, what are you going to say? John, what are you going to say? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you would go, I really don't think so. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, without even thinking, we'd go, sure. Right? That simple question dropped the number of no-shows from 30% to 10% overnight, oh. right? Now guess what? Our friends in sales are trained this all the time. Ask for the sale. The rest of us, after I read this, I'm like, I I've been so late. You know what I'd say to people? I'd say something like, hey, let me know if you have any issues. Yeah. Let, me, let me know if you need any. I, I, we don't ask for the commitment enough. So in this case, especially with volunteers, it might be one of those things of, this assignment, this specific thing. Will you have this done by our meeting on January 7th? The key on this one, pause and zip it. And there's three likely answers you're gonna get to that. What are you gonna get? Yes, no, and maybe, right? Yes, Chavez says you're more likely to do it, but you may want to check in on January 2nd and 3rd and 4th. Like that. Like, if they say no, I'm like, no, it didn't work, but what could you do? Why? Why? What's getting in the way? Is that something I can help? Could we find another volunteer to help with? But at least you know it now, not on January 7th when she doesn't deliver again. That's getting Peter Bregman told, Bregman told me during an interview. He goes, whenever you find yourself saying, there she did it again. I can't believe she did it again. She didn't deliver. He goes, stop saying you can't believe she didn't do it. That's what she does. She doesn't do it. So you need some sort of different tap, right? Same thing with the engineers. That that's what they do, so we need a different tap time. So, no, we know it now, not January 7th. What if they say maybe? How come you're non-committal? Yeah. What's, what's your local now? There you go. Guess what? This is just good life advice I found. Treat maybe like no. <laughs> <laughs> right? well, I'll, I'll try. I'll try. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, maybe it's some close cousins. Like, I'll try. Kids, kids know. I'm almost. Kids know this. You're exactly right. Yeah, kids know this for sure. And so what this would say is. Yeah, right. Treat it like a no, and which means you go to say, what's getting in the way? What's the concern? How can I help? But if you do those things, ask for a commitment. Social proof just means, hey, all the other volunteers, this is like every, this is the teenage equivalent of everyone else's parents are going, letting them go to that party. Yeah. <laughs> right? Anytime someone goes, well, the debate is over. Everyone knows. Seriously, everyone? 
right? Defend against this one. People are using this one on us all the time. All the time. Everybody knows. Be very careful about that. Liking, I don't think it's a surprise that we're more likely to say yes to people we like. That's a bit of a relatedness. And this is the only thing I just say on this one to defend against it. You're more likely to give in to people that you really like to stuff you shouldn't. That in order for us to hit this date, they're trying to rely on the relationship to get you to say yes to something you probably shouldn't say. And underneath liking, just one idea that he has in the book that, um, that I found is very helpful. He says, well, praise is part. Praise is underneath liking. The more you praise people, the more they're like, I like this person. They see my brilliance, right? So we like it. But, uh, you know, I think most of us would agree. Praise is good. But you know who we often forget to praise? It's people who are awesome all the time. That team member is just great all the time. We stop saying thank you often because why? Because they're, they're great all the time. That's what they do. So, and so it becomes like the old married couple where the wife's like, you never say you love me, you never say you love me. And the husband goes, I told you on our wedding day, if anything changes, I'll let you know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we can fall into that same trap. We can easily fall into that same trap. So you want to increase your liking, you want to increase your power, find a way to compliment that engineer. Uh, find a way, what, what's your name? Adrian. Adrian, yes. the auditor. Awesome. Uh, and so Adrian, the auditor, find ways to compliment them. Find ways to raise their status. Any way you can catch them doing something right, awesome. You guys are doing it. I mean, it's just so compliant. You know, you guys are diligent on that one. I'm, I'm impressed. What I try to do, I try to say, well, um, this is for our ultimate, but I try to, like, and say, this is for this together. And then talk about how we won't have to go back and bring over um, another exercise that we have to do right now. That's all perfectly internalized. Yeah. Like, it's a thousand months. Join the benefit. Show the benefits, but it's one of those things that sometimes people are like, but in the minute, in the moment, I feel like you're out to get because we're not we yet. Yeah. Is this, you know, so anything you can do to be part of their tribe, that might be the case. You have thought. Well, I, I don't know if it fits in here, but I I can't give them money a lot of times. Okay. The titles, they don't care. Uh, they, they're working, but they're retired at their desk. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I try to give them their time back. Yeah, so, but I don't know how that fits. If I can find a way that they can have. Better so, quality of life. Even if, like if you get the job done, you can go. Right. Some, that's, that's right. Yeah. Some, right. some that would be a version of reward that there's some positive benefit for doing this. And so if we get the if we, if we get this done before Thanksgiving, the summer's not going to be crazy, right? So you're just trying to get more work done in that time before you're trying to show some sort of benefit. To it. One, one more idea underneath like he talks about is <coughs> increased familiarity under positive circumstances. So, you know, Drew, I don't know how you feel about that engineer, but sometimes people like that just start driving me crazy where I'm gonna spend as little time as possible with them. I don't know if that would be the case in yours, but there are some people that we have to rely on, but we just don't like it. I mean, if we're just honest, we just don't like it. And, and because every time we're in the meeting with it, it just turns into this. And so what Charlie says, you wanna increase your influence in that situation? You need more interaction with them, but under positive circumstances. So instead of, because the opposite of that is as little as possible, then it's always like this. So one of the things we've learned is that my 18-year-old daughter's love language is spelled frappuccino. Yeah. <laughs> and truth is, she's more of a daddy girl than a mama's girl. So often, it's, it's not between me and her, it's between mom and her. And so what we've learned is my wife, more often than we used to, she'll take her out, we get the largest frappuccino, they get two empty cups, they'll split it, that's relatedness. And they won't talk about the points of contention. Boys, clothes, school. They just talk about girls stuff, which is probably boys and clothes. I don't know. I don't know. But, but the point is, it's not about the point of contention. So it's not about the audit. It's not about the assignment. It's not about the time tracking. It's more interaction with them. Uh, I, I would say, I would say, I, I would probably though maybe I would enjoy the Drew situation. I might be like, I can get to know that engineer. I can find out what makes that person tick. What are they into? What are their hobbies? What are their you know, what, what are their, what, what, what lights them up? And more often than not, I'm gonna to talk to them about those sorts of things. Now, you can make the decision, is that manipulation or influence? You can make that call, and I think it depends on how you do it. But it's one of those things that those will help you more. 
The last one I'll mention here is scarcity. And the idea of scarcity is we want what we can't have. This is why infomercials say it all the time. If you call in the next five minutes, right? They're running this 24 hours a day. But if they say if you call in the next five minutes. And probably the biggest thing I took from the interview with Chaldean, he goes, we often don't use this one enough. And when there's uncertainty, people get paralyzed. And when people are paralyzed, pull out the scarcity. It's the it's FOMO, fear of missing out. Listen, I don't we're not gonna do it, but we don't make this decision by here, then this is the problem. So you might need to do scarcity. You might be you might need to pull this out. If we don't have it in by here, this is what happens. It's not necessarily coercive, but it is putting a stake in the ground that we need a decision by here. So scarcity can be part of that one. Okay? Now, uh, Dr. Alan Cohen, just just maybe a couple things from from his book on this influence model. I'm going to go right to this one and say, diagnose the world the other person. If you want to influence that authority, diagnose the world the other person. Now, I don't think we have to think too hard about why that engineer doesn't want to do his stuff, right? I mean, I hate Tom Drag, personally. Maybe like the joke, maybe enjoy it. Um, have you ever written a status report and you're like, there is no human being in this world that is ever going to read this? <laughs> They're just going to copy and paste it into someone else. They're going to copy and paste it into someone else. I, I, was work, I had a coaching client in Hong Kong. He said, I've done the status report every week for six years. And I've never, ever gotten any feedback. Ever. Yeah? So where's his motivation going to be on that sort of thing? Man? And so, so it's, it's, it's not too hard to kind of figure out why we don't like it, but it's like, what's going on in there? What, what is it? Is he, does he feel like his status is going to be dropped? Is it that he's hiding stuff? Is it that he's seen things come and go, and if he holds off long enough, this whole agile thing or this whole whatever will go away? And, you know, so, but if you can diagnose the world the other person, sometimes you can find an end of, hmm, that's what it is, and find a way either to go around it or avoid it. But diagnose the world the other person. A lot of times volunteers have good intentions, but no time. And so we've got the wrong person in the role, or we need to find a way to, to skinny it down what we're asking. But if you can diagnose the world the other person, sometimes that can help. Okay? Uh, Tim David, this is that true influence soon to, uh, soon to be changed in the, uh, by title. But here's, here's one of the things he says. I'm just going to mention this one here. Actually, two things. He says a powerful phrase is, I need your help. It's almost like wired into us as humans that when someone asks for help, that that we're drawn towards that. And he calls it respectful transfer of emotion. Respectful transfer of emotion. He, he, the example he gives in the book is uh, his daughter's in ER, and sometimes there's nothing urgent about urgent care, right? It's just taking too long. And what he wanted to go is like, I can't, where is it? You know, he wanted to rant, but how much is that going to help you really? You know, not so much. Respectful transfer of emotion, he said, when a nurse came in, he goes, it's a pain you guys are strong. What is that in scarf? What did he just do? I know you're swollen. Like, Raise the stacks, right? I know you're smart. Uh, if this was your daughter, what would you recommend that do? He calls it respectful transfer of emotion. He's got this emotion. I want my I want to help the daughter. I want this person to feel the same sense of urgency. So it's a version of I need your help. By the way, when you say I need your help, what are you doing to their S and your S? Aren't you raising in some ways? Because you're not coming off as Mr. Miss Know It All, you're saying, I need your help. So that's also a version of that one there. So I need your help. If you're in my shoes, or, you know, how could I say this in such a way? So uh, he, you know, he talks about, you know, use their name for sure. But one of the things I love in the book, the cardinal law of persuasion is this never make the other person feel stupid. If we do anything, if you do anything to that senior engineer or those infrastructure engineers, that volunteer, you do anything to make the other person feel stupid, it's really kicking them in the ass of scarf. But no, now, I think very, like, I would never say to my wife, honey, that was a stupid comment you just made, right? I would never say that to her. Honestly, I just don't say anything to her. But would you agree that it's possible it could leak out of me? <laughs> no? Like maybe a slight roll of the eyes or something like that, and that's the same thing in the workplace. We can do little things that can make them feel stupid. Terminology we use and things like that. So never let the, never, never never make them feel stupid. And then he, he says in there the one thing that most of us I see this consistently with project managers. Uh, probably over seventy five percent of the project managers I work with directly, they need to express more confidence. They, it's almost like they think they're a note taker, 
or a meeting organizer, that they're just a status taker or tracker, not necessarily a leader. And there's times where we need to get in there and say, this needs to be signed off by Friday. And the words of the bylines and vocal to are aligned so that the message gets across. Can you have it done by Friday? Pause, right? Combining all that. But sometimes we need the plus one that assertiveness there to be more effective. And then finally he says, people want to stop helping if there's even a whiff of ingratitude. If there's even a whiff of ingratitude. And I don't know about you, when I'm really busy, I'm feeling the weight of a project going on, sometimes, I mean, I try to say thank you, but what if I go, all right, quick, thanks. That didn't exactly drip with, I'm really feeling uh, thankful. And so, once again, thankfulness is a version of raising your stats. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the examples we have. So we have volunteers, we have auditors trying to help engineers, we've got engineers trying to, we're trying to get this engineer to comply with process. Okay. Talk them on your table about anything we've talked about so far. In fact, I'll put this one thing up here if you're able to see it. This summarizes everything I talked about. If you. Um, if, if there's not an easy, if there's not an obvious place to get the slides, which I honestly don't know, uh, if you just look me up on LinkedIn and just say, hey, I was in the session of career today, would you send over the slides, I'll send you over the slides too. But for the last part of our discussion, our time together, can you think of one or more of these that you can employ for the volunteer, for the auditor trying to get the infrastructure engineers to open up a little more transparency to get compliance there? All right, start a conversation. Before we wrap it up, what, 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 what came up in your conversation? Somebody from that back table, what's something that came up in your uh, discussion? Thanks for volunteering, by the way. <laughs> so for the, um, the engineer who is reluctant to provide the status updates, maybe raise that engineer's status by saying, you know, there's nobody better than you to provide us with the, this information. You are the expert. You have all of this experience behind you. If you provide us with this information, it will move the project along faster. There you go. So, so, and you'd have to customize it to your voice and the culture there, but there's something about the raise of the status. And, and even as you said that, I kind of believe there's a subset of here is like, that's cold I mean, that is like, that's not even, that's not even true. But, so you have to decide where you take that. But I'm telling you, it's a remarkably lethal weapon. And so what is a way that you can find a way to use it in an ethical sort of way? So when I connect with somebody that I, or I want to connect with somebody on LinkedIn that I don't know very well, or maybe I don't know them all, but they just look like an interesting person, one of the things I'll put in the invite, I will say very specifically to them, hey, I would, uh, I have much to learn from you. I, I say that to them. Now, I'm not, personally, that's not flattery to me, because if there's somebody out there that you and I can't learn from, we're messed up, right? We can learn from anybody. But it is, a, it is a form of this, of like, a, of like building their status up, right? So if you can find some variation of that for these, uh, let's take uh, one more example for time. Uh, what else? What's another thing we can do in any of those examples? For the, the auditing yeah. um, issue with that, that, you know, that, a couple of things, if the auditor comes to the team before and I'm uh, saying, I'm here to audit you, but I need your help. I need your help, yeah, right? I need your help. Yeah. Um, Maybe on a one on one, like, hey, if you were me, right? Or, or uh, you know, what is it that drives you crazy about auditors? Or, you know, I know it probably seems like I'm just, you know, a lot of times it feels like auditors are just looking over your shoulder or some, some, something to just like, all right, that's that's out there. But if we just find some version of we. I'm just thinking for the one monitor, I would probably say something like, these issues came up the last three years. Can you help me? So we can work something else for next year a little better. Because it right. always comes up. And like, right. I want to take this off of your board. Right. But if you, you see you didn't go, hey, make my job easier, right? That would be ingratitude. Um, mm -hmm. anything you can do to not make them feel stupid, drop their ass on that. You know, yeah. uh, here's just let me wrap it up by saying this way. I think sometimes people feel like you're either influential or you're not. Either, it's almost like a DNA thing. Like you're a good negotiator, you're not a good negotiator. You're a good influencer or not. Either thank your parents or blame your parents, right? Either, you know, it, it feels like it's that. And can I just say that every one of us can get better at this thing. And every one of us can get better at defending against the parents. 
so we don't get talked into doing this. And maybe a good next step might be find uh, one or two of those references and say, I'll listen to the interview first, and if it still sounds good, I'll buy the book, unless it's $300, and then you'll wait. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But can I just invite you to raise the stats of the people around you? Don't do anything. Provide more uncertainty. Give them autonomy. Left arm or right arm, right? Give them some choices. Anything you can do along these lines, it's not, it's not like, this is not Jedi, right? I mean, this is, this is, it, none, none of these techniques are going to be guaranteed to work all the time. But I got to tell you, you can increase your bad image. Just asking for a commitment will increase your bad image. And last, I'm going to put a plug in for the chapter. If you're visiting, you're not a member of the chapter, you are missing out. Because there are people here that you can network and build relationships with and pass your scenarios by that, that can help you in so many different ways. This is not just networking because you might want a job someday. This is networking because you can get insight and help by other people in this chapter. Too many of us are isolated and off on our own. And there's a big we available to you right here in the chapter. Thank you for coming. Thank you.